Holy Spirit, we just invite you afresh to come in, fill this time, fill this word. <laughs> you are the wild one, and so we align with you for this time, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, hi. This is going to be a little bit different. Last night we had the deck. It went really well, um, but we had a major problem with some tech stuff and uh, wasn't able to run the PowerPoint. Just talked through some of the things, but this will be a little bit more intimate because I'm doing this for the replay. Um, we have a fair number of people now who can't be here and so we're watching from different places and locations and uh, want to be able to give you the full benefit of what I think is happening in this month, what the Spirit's been stirring in me. So it's a little bit weird because I don't have people in here, but this was the easiest way was to just kind of reshoot it in our normal setting, um, but without the interaction. So I don't know how well this is going to go, but here we go. So um, if you got the ping, uh, when light and darkness face off, um, Every time we come into a new month, we link back in part to this Proverbs passage about trusting in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And we get that part, but we got to go into the next, which is honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your increase. And because of that, there's a blessing that comes. And so every new month, and we're in a new month now called the month of Kislev, which is the ninth biblical month, uh, we stop and, and say, okay, God, what are you saying in this time? We want to bring our first thoughts, our resources, our time and energy, and, and lay it before the Lord, and then let him speak into things. And this is important because um, the idea of the new moon is to break a cycle of the last month and break it off. And uh, many have had a rough time in November. Maybe it's a great time. Um, but you want to get the grace to let that close off and then see what the Spirit is saying now for the new month. And I find this verse fascinating in Isaiah 66 because this is talking about for just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make endure before me, declares the Lord, your descendants and your name will endure from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come to worship before me. So this is talking about actually after the full restoration of a new heaven and new earth, the new moon will still be something that, that is recognized. And so we know that there's an anchor for us to continue to do that now. Um, it's not a superstitious thing. It's not a, um, a legalistic thing, but it's a belief that God is seasoning words and revelation in time so that we can align properly with it. And so to that effect, I always look for different ways of illustrating this. I've pulled on this before, but fun movie. I love this movie, uh, National Treasure. And there's a scene in there, if you've seen the movie, where uh, they have to get these special glasses in order to read something that is right there, but they can't see it. And he realizes at one point that all these different filters that are on these glasses have to be used to be able to see the fullness of this map and get the next part of the revelation. So that's kind of what we have to do. There's a biblical worldview of time that we have, and we use the Word of God to overlay and say, okay, God, what are you doing now in this time? What are, what's Clearly, it's actually visible. It was on that treasure map, but it wasn't visible to him until he had the right combination of lenses. So what are some of the filters that we use in this time? Well, the first thing is that we look at the Hebraic year. Because we think God's involved in time, he's outside of it, but he's placed us in time. And the calendar that's been connected to him, the Hebraic calendar, it's the year 5780. And the thing that's shifted that we've moved into now is that 80, which is that next decade. And it's actually more than that, it's a whole new era. And the Hebrew does not have numbers, it has letters that represent the numbers, very much like Roman numeral X means 10. In this case, the, the Hebrew letter for the number 80 is the Hebrew letter Pei. And Pei is a picture of a mouth, and so it mouth, face, lips, the edge or the border are all connected into that. It represents those things. It looks like the picture of a face or of a mouth. And so we use that as one of the keys because in this new era, we believe that there's 
critical importance about what is released, what we decree, what comes from our face, what's released by our mouth. And there is a roar of the lion that has to be picked up in us. And as we decree what the Lord is giving us, there's power that is released in that. But it's also a time, because of that idea of representing with the face, of face-offs. And it's a face-to-face -face kind of encounter that we're frequently being drawn into, and most specifically with the Lord, because that's where that impart of his roar into us gets picked up, and then we decree what he has set within us. So that's one of the important contexts that we have there. And then we take and we go and dig deeper into the Word of God. And so we look at this ninth biblical month, and we see that it's called Kislev, which also means my confidence. There are seven biblical references specifically talking about that. But then we also look at what tribe is connected to it. And when the Lord took Israel out into the wilderness, he reordered a lot of things. He reordered their time, and then he reordered the tribal alignments. And he set them in order around the tabernacle. And the ninth tribe was Benjamin. Not just in that, but the ninth tribe when they would offer sacrifice was Benjamin. And the ninth tribe when they would march out to warfare is Benjamin. So we think there's some justification to, okay, let, let's look at the tribe of Benjamin in this time and see how that connects. So we add those things. Oh, and then one other thing. The Feast of Hanukkah which actually is, is not directly talked about in Scripture as far as a feast. It happens in the intertestamental period, and we're going to talk about that later. But that event is anchored in John 10, when John writes that it's during this feast of Hanukkah, or dedication, or rededication. And again, we'll go into details later on that. It's when Jesus is in the temple in Solomon's colonnade, and this whole confrontation happens. And so that is set in time. Major transactions that happen are set in time. And then one last thing that we'll get into later. Many of you know this. We've done the math for you before. Most people know that Jesus was not born on the 25th of December. In fact, not even in that month. Um, in part because shepherds don't watch over their sheep in the open fields when it's that cold in December in, uh, in Israel. So there's been a clear awareness of that. We won't go into how that got made crazy. But there is a way actually to get a pretty good handle on when Jesus was born and when he was conceived. And we'll do that in a few weeks. But for now, if you don't know the math, just know it lands Jesus' conception right around the Feast of Hanukkah, which is what also is called the Feast of Lights. And so it is also during this time, this month of Kislev, that the angel Gabriel would have done a face-to-face -face with Mary and said, Mary, here you go. This is what's coming down. And so it is that time. That's another critical element in looking at this month and drawing in the revelation, drawing in, okay, God, what do you need me to see and hear and know during this time? So we keep going. So on a biblical worldview, taking the same idea of that uh, national treasure, we look for the declarations that are coming out of this new area. We look for face-to-face, because -face, that's the bigger context. Then we roll into it the ninth month references and the ninth tribe of Benjamin, and then the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah. And all those things are begin to form a pattern of revelation. And we go, okay, God, what are you saying now? What do you need us to pay attention to now? And it gives us a corrected vision in order to be able to see what uh, we think God is speaking into. And, you know, some say, oh, that's just so crazy. It's like, okay, but it's all pointing us back into Scripture. Where do you want to go? <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go more on that later. So just to give you some of the ninth references that are in Scripture, in Ezra, there's a face-off about marriages. You can go look at that reference in the ninth month in Kislev. In Jeremiah 36, there's an intense face-off with the king, but it happens through the prophetic revelation that Jeremiah releases and how the king is going to deal with that. And he actually deals with it pretty poorly in that as each part is read, he cuts it off with a knife and throws it into the fire. Nehemiah has to face off the bad news hearing about the exiles, and it sets in motion a whole strategy. He gets it, in a sense, impregnated in this time of that happening with 
by the Spirit a deep sadness and a grieving that's going to move and motivate him forward into what's next. You have Haggai too. He has to face off the people about give careful thought to your ways. This is a time to consider what's going down. Zechariah has to face him off about true worship and where it's going. Of course, John 10, we see that there's this face off between Jesus and the Pharisees in which they want to stone him. All of these, these confrontations that are coming down. And then we flip over. Is that too fast? <laughs> you can look at it all. I'm doing this kind of quickly. Um, but when we look at the tribe of Benjamin, as I press into this, and you know, nine is also about conception, pregnancy, it's about birth and all those kind of things. And so you get to the ninth tribe and this ninth tribe, Benjamin, has a particular focus about the birth issue. And it sets a trajectory in I believe the life of the tribe that's important for us to get in this time. And so in Benjamin, they journeyed from, uh, this is in Genesis 35, from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrah, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear, you will have this son also very traumatic, dramatic moment in this. And most of you know the result of this. So it was as her, that is Rachel's soul was departing that she called his name Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. Imprint, powerful, what's declared, what you call a thing. And this is a, is an interesting sorrow. It's pretty unfair proclamation to make over your kid but Jacob steps in and but his father called him Benjamin which means son of my strength and so the issue within this tribe that there's really kind of a two nature wrestling that goes on and it's very true for most of us son of sorrow son of strength and so it's going to draw up in this time where is sorrow operating where is strength and what is the source of those things? But I need you to re be reminded of this, that of all the tribes, of all the other 11 brothers, Benjamin is the only one that's actually born in the promised land. So there is a focus in this time, I think particularly that we need to pay attention to about Israel and what's going down in Israel because of that very fact. And you know, the promise was released where it was always destined to be. So there's, there's a heart sink. There's something very powerful within the tribe of Benjamin that's represented about that, that they're actually born in the right place in time, as is Jesus, right? Okay, so there's something, there's the connection of all these things, but we keep going. And then the question of how does Jacob deal with the sorrow? You know, you know the story of Rachel. You know how much he loved her. It says that, um, you know, he had to work an extra seven years, right, just to be able to, to purchase her, as it were, from Laban. And it says that it was, seemed to him like almost as nothing because his love for her was so great. So keep that in mind in the midst of the sorrow. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Interesting connect. Over her tomb, Jacob set a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Jacob's tomb. And then he moved. And it brings the issue about how we deal with sorrow and loss. And he does the right thing. You have to acknowledge it. You've got to process this, but you can't have it anchor you there. He doesn't build an altar. He doesn't set up a tabernacle. He doesn't stay there and camp out forever. There's, there's an understanding of setting a memorial and then moving on. So at that painful moment, do I stay there or do I move forward? It's a moment of decision that can last and last and will have implications for us. And so I think there's a focus in this. And it shifts also this idea about the new name, right? Benoni, son of sorrow. Benjamin, son of strength. What we call what happened and it's interesting because you know that Abram is called Abraham, Jacob becomes Israel, Simon becomes Peter. You have all these, these ways in which God rebrands someone. 
And then the question is, how are they remembered? What's the legacy of that? And it brings up the question about how we do this in their failures. What are they called? So, you know, Abraham does a lousy job in trying to protect his wife in some ways, right? When he gets into Egypt and he says, well, tell him you're my sister. And you know how that goes. But he's not remembered as Abraham the liar. He's remembered as the friend of God. David is a man who is an adulterer, who, you know, conspires to murder but he's not remembered as that. He's remembered as a man after God's own heart. How we remember even those things in the failure, we don't turn a blind eye to them, but what is God saying into that? What, what are the traumas? What are the dramas? What are the lies that we've had? And how are we identifying those? And are we remembering them um, rightly? Or are we remembering them with redemption in mind? Okay, so there is this intensity in Benjamin that comes out of this strength. And Jacob's blessing, it's interesting, years later, right? Son of my strength, he declares this, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Intense, warlike tribe. And you see this um, throughout in Scripture, First Chronicles 8, the sons of Ulam were brave warriors who could handle the bow. All of these were descendants of Benjamin. Second Chronicles, Asa had an army, 280,000 from Benjamin, armed with small shields and with bows. First Chronicles 12, there were the men who came to David at Ziklag. They were armed with bows, able to shoot arrows to sl- and to sling stones, right-handed or left-handed, They were kinsmen of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. So the whole thing of the archer is very connected in with with Benjamin. But the issue about that fierceness, that ability to be intense, to take the fight to the enemy is there. And we see it reflected then in a lot of the characters. But let me get into this first. It's contrasted. Remember these two parts, the sorrow, which often deals with a deep, tenderness, it has a negative potential, but the strength that also has negative and positive. But this is the blessing that then Moses releases over the tribe of Benjamin. The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Very interesting and stark contrast with these two. And indeed, when Benjamin is set up as a territory, we see that the beloved city, Jerusalem, is actually nestled in there and carried in the the middle on the shoulders of Benjamin. The beloved shall dwell between his his shoulders. So we see that prophecy that Moses released is fulfilled, excuse me, fulfilled in the actual land allotment for the tribe of Benjamin. So you have in this kind of intense look with the tribe of Benjamin. And it's characterized then as you see the people that are connected with the tribe. Ehud is one of the first prominent leaders we see in Judges that is a Benjamite. A left-handed man who is able to then hide a sword on his opposite thigh and ultimately assassinates an evil king. You've got King Saul. You know all sorts of things about that. Obviously, his son Jonathan. You've got Mordecai, critical player, pretty fierce, pretty intense. You've got Esther of this stream. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul. (laughs) Any question about how intense he was? And that passion, that strength is moving there, but there's also this aspect that they're dangerous deliverers, right? We see that in Saul. You'll see it also if you look in Judges 19 through 21 and a whole episode that involves the whole tribe of Benjamin where it is virtual civil war with Israel. All of Israel comes against the tribe of Benjamin and almost completely uh, wipes it out. So there is this side where they can move in strength in an unrighteous way or they can move in strength in righteousness. You see it with Saul. You see it with first Saul and then Paul as the apostle. Okay, that question remains. And they're always cunning warriors, and there's always this question about who they're aligned with. What's really driving them? 
And I think some of that goes back to that early issue of sorrow and how it's processed. And that then drives what kind of strength is coming out of that. And that's all things we need to look at in this month. So there's this question here. Are we in a worldly sorrow about certain things, which is going to turn us down and inward? Or are we in godly sorrow? I like the picture of this woman because she feels like she's kind of in a mess, but she's working to get her hands up. And godly sorrow, yes, it says leads to repentance, but you have to understand godly sorrow doesn't mean necessarily you're going through something where you need to repent for. Godly sorrow can just be a deep loss that you have. But godly sorrow will always move us back to the Lord. Lord, I don't, I don't understand, but I praise you. I honor you. Help me process this through. Help me see it the way that you want to, want to use this in my life and in my heart. And how we move with that will often then drive a question to whether we're then moving in a kind of anger, because that's often what will come out of a worldly sorrow is a determination to hurt back or not be hurt again or something, or whether we move in a godly strength. And so in this month, in this ninth month of Kislev, in this one connected to the tribe of Benjamin, how are you doing with processing it? And we have to be careful because you, we need to process sorrow. You can't just deny it. Oh, everything's fine. You, you have to let God walk you through that. But if you're walking it with God, then out of that will come the right kind of godly strength. If you're just staying in sorrow, then you're probably moving into a worldly sorrow. Okay? That's, the enemy's going to win then. Okay? Now, one other thing i got to mention. I've seen too often where... The body can think that we're moving in godly strength when actually we're moving in worldly strength because the motives are not right. Very important that we're aligned properly out of the sorrow into the strength so that we move in his power. Again, uh, the problem with righteous anger tends to be that it's 95% anger and only 5% righteous. So be aware of how you work in that. Keep going. So I feel like this is a time when we see a lot of confrontation between light and dark. When you look at Jesus' confrontation in John 10, it is intense to the point where he finally has to make a declaration and they pick up stones. Okay, I mean, and he's got to slip away in that. Process through the sorrow into the right strength so that you know how to be strong in the midst of those confrontations. And remember that we go through the sorrow because Jesus was a man of sorrows, but he is victorious. Paul says we're always carrying around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be present in you. So this connection between those two is real critical in this month. And then I linked it over because in the midst of conflict of light and dark, because when you think about it, even in the natural, this time of year, in the month of Kislev, the nights are getting longer and longer. The days are getting shorter and shorter. And so there is an increase of darkness. But in the midst of that, light breaks through. Gabriel shows up to Mary. Okay. And life begins in her. The, the life, the light shows up in her. And so this verse is... Um, one of the most troubling to many biblical scholars. This is from Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I don't think I ever heard that taught on um, growing up in the church because I think most folks are just not quite sure what to do with it. Often the interpretation has been, um, well, Jesus was talking about all the persecution coming against him and, and, and et cetera, and the violent take it by force is that uh, there's other forces going to try to come in and co-opt it and take it and everything else. And there's some accuracy to that, but it's missing some key parts. There's two ways in which that Greek verb can uh, be understood. One is in a passive voice in which it is happening to it. So indeed, it's suffering under that violence and others are taking it, you know, and it's just in some ways almost being victimized. And there is some truth in terms of how that works. But the context and all leads it more to what's called the, the, the reflective 
voice, the middle voice, where this is something actually that moves in it. And so let me give you some translations here. This is from the Phillips translation. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been taken by storm. <laughs> it's been taken by storm. It's, it's, it's being grasped. It's dynamic. And eager men are forcing their way into it. There is a laying hold of it. Let me give you another translation. This is from the uh, Passion Translation. From the moment John stepped onto the scene until now, the realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth and passionate people have taken hold of its power. In the midst of this clash of light and dark, I think this verse is very re relevant because there is the battle and the battle is laying hold of the fullness of which God has given to us in the light. Let me give you this from another scholar. The kingdom of heaven is vigorously pressing itself forward and forceful people are eagerly taking it. Yeah, makes sense. So there's much more we could do on this. Let me give you one quick thing because... Um, Charles Spurgeon does an entire sermon on this, and I had come into parts of it, and then a conversation with one of our allies referenced the whole sermon, so I was looking at it. And he presents this as saying about, we are responsible to press forward um, into the fullness. But, says one man, do you wish us to understand that if a man is to be saved, he must use violence and vehement earnestness in order to obtain salvation? Sounds a bit like works, right? I do, most assuredly. That is the doctrine of the text. But, says one, I thought it was all the work of God. So it is, from first to last. But when God has begun the work in the soul, the constant effect of God's work in us is to set us working. And where God's spirit is really striving with us, we shall begin to strive too. This is just a test whereby we may distinguish the men who have received the Spirit of God from those who have not received it. Those who have received the Spirit in verity and truth are violent men. They have a violent anxiety to be saved and they violently strive that they may enter in at the straight gate. Well, they know that seeking to enter in is not enough, for many shall seek to enter in, but shall not be able, and therefore, do they strive with might and main? A little bit old on the English, but you get the point. This is a time in a month when we call on that stream of strength that flows through the inheritance from the tribe of Benjamin in Jesus, who brings all that prophecy to fullness. And in Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And we see the challenge to rise up and to move in the strength and to take it, understanding that the kingdom of God breaks forward in violence. It's just how it moves. Not in a physical violence, it's in a spiritual violence. We're talking about this specific verse um, with our, our allies in the prison and understanding their responsibility not to move in physical violence, but there's a spiritual battle that's going on and how are they aligning with the Lord for that? So the Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. We see that so clearly in Mordecai, okay? <laughs> you see also in him that there's a tenderness in Mordecai about a father in terms of how he fathers uh, Esther. But when the time comes, he confronts her. And when he is made basically prime minister, he moves with deft authority. You see that Esther in terms of what she is willing to do and how she's got to move out of that place she was into really a fierceness with the king. Who's doing these things? This vile Haman and goes on. See it in Apostle Paul, right? I mean, my goodness, he is always intense, whether it is against the cross or for the cross. Um, and violence does ensue. It's just part of what happens. But I want to connect in on this. We're bringing this up with the guys as well about the sword of the Spirit. You know this verse out of Ephesians 6, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There are three words that are used typically in Scripture for word. One is graphe, which is relating to scripture, okay, that which is written. 
Second is logos, the word of God. Logos, in the beginning was the word. You know that. It's Christ. It's the embodiment. But the third is rhema. And rhema is that which is or has been uttered by the living voice, a thing spoken or a word. And uh, Dutch Sheets recently was reminding us that that word rhema isn't a, uh, in a particularly spiritual word. It's just speaking about an utterance, that which was said. And so when we understand the word of God as a sword, we have to understand it connects in with what we are saying. Yes, it comes from graphe. Yes, it comes from logos, okay, because we're informed by the Bible, by the word of God. We're, it all connects, and so it's moving in alignment with the fullness of who Jesus is. It's also seeing the prophetic utterance that God has releasing, but then how do we take it up and release it into the atmosphere? That is the word of God. That is unsheathing the sword and making full use of it. And in a time of the clash of light and dark, in a time of understanding um, the warlike nature within the tribe of Benjamin with a protective heart, okay, the right kind of strength. How we war is by now the declaration, and that fits right back in with this new era that we're in that's anchored in the Hebrew letter pay with the mouth, with the face off, with the what is uttered, what is spoken. And so there are in these scriptures that we see specific, what I would call declarations of war. So in Jacob, there's an opportunity when it could be son of my sorrow, and he wars with no son of my strength. There's a situation with Mordecai where he's got a war and say, hey, for such a time as this, that is a clear sword that has got to go out, and it has to go out to whom? Esther. It's got to go within the body of Jesus. And he even says, do not think that just because you're in the king's household, and if you do nothing, you will be spared. Okay, Whoosh. He's got to make that declaration, which helps her to shift. And then Mary even has to make a declaration when that revelation comes in this month from the angel Gabriel, let it be to me as you have said. Okay, that is a warfare declaration because it's receiving in now and aligning her in time. And then Jesus in the temple where he has to make this declaration in the face of those who are trying to figure out, are you really the Messiah? And he says, I and the Father am one. Warfare, warfare, warfare by that which is declared and spoken. And so it is a month, though, to check your alignment. Like we mentioned, Jacob can move in sorrow or strength. Esther can stay aligned under the king and just try to be there, or she can realign under Mordecai. Paul has to decide for or against Jesus. And it's a month where we see that the alignment shifts. And so Jacob comes under strength, Esther under Mordecai, and of course, Paul for Jesus. So watch your alignments in this time. See what God is stirring. Where are we aligning with godly sorrow to process through to godly strength or are we moving in worldly sorrow in self-pity yeah that's one i can go into and then out of that it can come frustration anger there's a strength that comes in that but it's worldly strength it's not godly strength so in this month what's in your mouth this month what is the word that you need to release what is the sword that god has given you that you need to declare and you know, we have got to be willing to be violent, not physical violent. Violence in the spirit by what we declare in the face of things that are coming at you. And it may be at or with someone. It may be alone with the Lord. Again, with our men uh, that we work with in the prison, we're trying to help them understand the power of what they release by declaration, when they align fully with what God has said, what God has promised, and they have the graphe, they understand it's all by the, by the blood, by the resurrection of Jesus. What are they then raiming? What's the rhema that they release in all of that? So what will be your declaration in this month? And how will you align in time, in this critical time, right as we're about to move into another decade, the year 2020, and all the things that's going on with that.
So this is last slide, which was the first one, if you can see the medallion there has the Lion of Judah, but the fist is coming up a little bit singed, but in power. The kingdom of God moves forward violently, okay? Confrontations ensue. We have to be willing to step into that and war accordingly. What's the deep sorrow? Sorrows that are still waiting for you to process. Some probably because there's still a worldly aspect to that. And let God begin to process that through. You may have to set a memorial to it, and you've got to probably rename it so that God can begin to move you from that and into the strength. Benjamin's an interesting and a dangerous tribe. We could look more at the life of King Saul, and you know one who moved brilliantly with God for a while because it said that God had changed him, okay? And yet, in the midst of loss, the loss of reputation, the loss of his men running away, and etc., he goes into worldly strength. And he tries to stand up and do things that he was not called to do, and on and on, and it costs him. So there's this warning in this time with the tribe of Benjamin. But then you got to look at the Apostle Paul, right, who was so willing to lay his life down. So month of conception, month of new things coming forth, a month of warfare, a month of understanding, though, the deep heart of a Mordecai, okay, that is willing to be a father but say the right word in time to challenge his beloved. Father, I pray that this recap <laughs> resounds deeply in all of us. Help us, help me to process the worldly sorrow that I'm still holding on to and any self-pity connected to it. And Lord, show us how to align fully in this time, rightly in this time, to move in the fullness of of what you've released through your word and to the glory of Jesus. Amen.